Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Keith. Uh, today we're going to be talking about MaxFlow. Uh, so MaxFlow is kind of a unique topic because it's very templated. Um, you can just sort of use the implementation as a black box and apply it. You often don't have to consider the internals of it when actually using it in CP. Um, yeah, you can just copy the template and use it. Um, usually the more interesting part is converting a problem from like whatever it's given to a max flow problem. And th this is usually the hard part. Um, and as I said, you can just use the implementation as is. Um, however, uh, max flow algorithms are, are very rich and interesting subjects in of themselves. Um, so in this presentation, I'm gonna sort of do a compromise where we'll give a quick explanation of one of the basic algorithms and like some basic ideas behind them um, with no proofs or anything. And then we're gonna move on to the actual applicable part. So to start off, I want to define what a flow network is. Um, it's an under, it's a directed graph. So a directed graph is like a bunch of nodes with edges between them from one to another where the direction matters. And we have some function, some label on the edges called the capacity uh, given at C of U and V. So you can think of these labels on all these edges with the capacities. Um, and the way you want to think about this is water flowing through pipes, hence the name flow. Um, so th these labels on the pipes um, are sort of, you want to think of the size of the pipes, as in how much water can flow through that pipe. It's so like 16 gallons of water can flow through that pipe a second, whereas only nine gallons can flow through this pipe in a second. Um, and yeah, these pipes lead from this junction to this junction and so on. Um, and we mark one node uh, as S for source. In this case, zero is marked as source. And another node we mark as T for sink. And in this case, five is marked as sink. Um, and on these flow networks, you can define what is called a flow. Um, a flow is a further labeling or assignment to edges, f of uv. And you can see here, this first number is like the, is the flow, and the second number is the capacity here. Um, and again, you want to think of this as water flowing through pipe. So in this case, the flow is literally how much water is actually flowing through the pipe in a given situation. So whereas the capacity was the maximum amount that could flow through that pipe, flow is the amount that sort of is flowing through that pipe. So 11 out of the six, 11 gallons is flowing through this pipe or something like that. Um, so obviously F needs to be less than equal to C. So you can't have more water flowing through a pipe than it can physically hold um, for, for a flow to be like valid. Um, and additionally, the amount of water flowing into a junction has to equal the water flowing out of the junction. So for example, here 11 plus one, so 12 gallons is flowing into junction A whereas uh, 12 is flowing out of junction A, so it's all good. Water can't be created out of nothing, and it can't disappear into a node. Um, the exception for this, obviously, is the source and the sink. So source is sort of considered the source of the water flow, and the sink is like the destination for the water flow. Okay. Any questions so far? OK. Um, so now, sort of the big goal here is to maximize the flow. So when I say that, we first have to define these sort of the size of the flow here, which is the outflow of the source or, or the outflow of the sink, the inflow of the sink. They're the same number, right? How much ever water is created here has to be destroyed here. So whatever that number is. So here it's 11 and 8, so 19. The flow of this thing is 19. The amount of water going from here to here. Um, and we call that amount of water uh, the sort of size of the flow. And the overall goal here is to find some flow, some assignment of, of f to the edges that maximizes the size of the flow. Okay. okay. Uh, so now let's consider some ways we can approach this. So the first thing you might think of is to try a greedy approach. So what would greedy entail in this situation? Um, one way you could think about this is that you look at some sort of un, what we call an unsaturated path. So by that, I mean um, a path that can add, you can add water to. For example, uh, here there, there is no unsaturated paths right now. But if all the flows were currently zero, you could think of like going from here, 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 if, if these were zero, right? Um, and you could, you could think of looking at a path that has some empty capacities left in every edge in it from the source to the sink and just increment it, add a flow to it. Uh, this is called augmenting the path. Okay, um, And then you just keep going until you can't anymore. So that would be one greedy approach. Uh, and by keep going, I mean like 
you keep finding these paths until there is no path left. Yeah. That's the point. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, this doesn't work. So this is a very good example of that. Um, so if, as I mentioned earlier, if you if you just start with the empty graph with the with no flows, you could think of this as a, as an unsaturated path, right? If this was zero zero zero, you could add flow to it. So let's say you add flow to that. And now you have no more unsaturated paths. You could, there's no path from S to T, which does which has like room left over for water, right? However, this is not um, a maximal flow because you're only pushing one unit of flow through to, from S to T. Whereas the best answer would be two because you can go from here and here, and then from here to here. Does that make sense? Okay. So greedy doesn't work, um, but we can slightly modify this greedy approach to make it work. Um, and then the way we do this is by allowing ourselves to send flow backwards. So when we're finding an augmented path, we don't just look for edges that have room open, that, that allow you to have some amount of a flow left over. Uh, we also allow you to sort of send flow in the opposite direction of an edge. So in this picture here, we're allowing ourselves to sort of send water backwards. Um, of course, you really can't actually send waters backwards through a path in the flow graph. But what you want to think about is if there is some positive flow in this direction, you can think of sending a positive flow in this direction as just subtracting flow from here, sending negative flow in this direction. And so while all the flows remain greater than or equal to zero and less than the capacity, you can think of sending it backwards and just subtracting from this value. And so when you're finding augmenting paths, you, you include that in your sort of search of, of these paths. Um, and while there is a path like this, like Joe said, you take it and then you look for a new path and keep on doing this in the same way you do it for the greedy. Uh, and this turns out to work. So for example, here, if we do do this path first, as unsaturated, or saturating this one first, um, then after that, we, we're not done because we have another path we can augment because we can go this, send it backwards, and then this like this. So what happened then? This would stay one. This would become one flow. This would go back down to zero. And these would also become one. So then you would get your answer of the two flow. Do we have that as an animation, by the way? But we do have an animation. Yeah, I think so. Oh, but, OK, yeah, yeah. So you can see you, uh, by setting flow backwards, and as the blue arrows indicate, you get the actual correct answer of a flow of two. I mean, this general idea is called the forward focus forward Fulkerson algorithm. Um, note that I haven't sort of really described how to find these augmenting pads. And the different ways you do, you do this sort of give rise to different variations of the forward focus algorithm. Um, if you use a BFS, this is the very famous Edmonds Karp algorithm, and that works fine. Um, but in, in, in general, there's a whole host of these the variations on this that you can consider. Um, OK, any questions? OK, oh, oh Adam Jamil has a question. No, OK. OK, let's keep going then. So let's consider, let's talk about implementation now. So I described the forward focus algorithm, but that's not the one we usually use. Um, for various reasons, uh, it's, it uh, include mainly just speed, honestly, and then ease of sort of writing it uh, and, and different situations you can use it in. We use something called, uh, we use something called uh, the Dynix algorithm. There's a whole a bunch of other algorithms, a whole zoo of them, including, uh, yeah, well, I think we'll cover that in a bit, but we, we use what's called Dynix algorithm. And this works in a completely different way than what I described above. Um, they use something called, uh, they use like different layers of a graph. They use like a layered graph. And uh, yeah, and it, it does stuff like that. Um, so the template, this template over here, you can find on this link. Um, and its complexity is O V squared E. So V is the number of vertices and E is the number of edges in your graph. That's the complexity. However, um, on various restricted types of graphs, for example, if you let the graph only have unit size edges or things like that, on various different types of restrictions, uh, Dynix can have much, much better complexity. And that's one of the things we find really attractive about it, it in terms of having it as a template, um, because a whole bunch of different problems have different types of restrictions that, that, that you can apply to your graph. And Dynix can really work as like a one size fit all in many cases. And that's very nice to have. Um, there's other algorithms. Uh, one thing you can do is use scaling, which is sort of the idea of finding, of fitting uh, powers of two of the flow at a time. So looking at different powers of two at a time and fitting those. That can provide like a speed up. Um, the sort of fastest algorithm, I think, uh, in practicality on all general graphs 
is this push re- is the highest label highest something push relabel algorithm highest label push 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 relabel um that's the sort of state of the art for competitive programming uh and that's one you can use also and there's, there's a whole bunch of other ones but this is the one that we use uh, at least yeah okay so how do you actually use this template so you have to so it depends on this uh, macro called s so you have to first define s to be the maximum number of nodes in your graph plus like 10 or something plus a small number um, and S in this case then becomes the index of the source node, and then T, which is S plus one, you have, to, you have to just use S plus one everywhere you want to use T, will be the index of the sync when you're making your graph. And uh, yeah, and then you just have to use this add edge function to add your edges and make your graph. So you define this flow graph as a thing of type DINIC, and you add all the edges you want. So it's from from source to one with capacity one, from source to two with capacity one, from one to two with capacity five from node two to, cap- to the sync with capacity one, and so on and so forth. Then you can actually run the Dynix algorithm using the calc function, and then you have its answer. Yeah, so if you were like actually solving a problem with max flow, this is like all the code you would need to write, basically. Because you just copy the template, and then all you would need to do is figure out like which edges do you want to add. Um, and then once you have that, you can just run calc, and it'll work pretty much. So the template was like a lot of code. Um, I guess it could look kind of intimidating, but you don't really need to care about it. Uh, okay, so I guess we'll go into problems now. Uh, any questions at all on anything what I've done so far? Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is the problem of bipartite matching, maximum bipartite matching. So uh, let's say you're a student, and you have there's n classes that you could maybe take, okay? And on in your daily schedule, you have m time slots available, or like weekly or whatever. You have m time slots you need to fill, or want or could fill, um, okay? And each class is offered at some set of time slots. For example, this class right here, look at this class. This is offered at time slots this one and this one. So Class one is offered at time slots two and three. Oh, Joe? Yeah, I thought I let everyone in, but yeah, I keep going. Okay. Uh, yeah, so this first class is offered at is offered at this time slot two and time slot three. Uh, this class is only offered at this time slot. This class is offered at this time slot and this time slot, and so on. Um. And the question is, what is the maximum number of classes you can take, with without obviously taking two time slots, at the, two classes at the same time slot, or taking the same class twice? Uh, so, for example, in this case, the uh, the answer is five. You can take five uh, classes. For example, you can take this class, at this time slot, this one at this one, and you can see what what I mean. Okay. Uh, this problem shows up a lot as a sort of sub-problem in, in, in many competitive programming uh, problems. And I think we'll cover some of those down below. Um, but he, here is the problem just as itself. So, any, any ideas? A uh, hint is going to be involved in using flow. So you, have just th- you should think about setting up a flow network that will solve this problem. Uh, yeah, Daniel, that, that's correct. Um, can you be more specific on what the capacities would be for this? And, and what the other edges would be? Yeah, exactly. That's right. So Daniel got it. Um, so what you want to do is uh, 
put an edge from S from the sink, a source to all the classes with capacity one, and then edges from like the edges that I really had in the previous slide from the classes, the times they were offered, uh, all with capacity one again, and then uh, edges from those time slots to the sink, all with capacity one. So when you go to actually find the max flow, right? Why does this work? Well, these edges constrain you to the fact that you can only take each class once, right? You can't have more than one flow going through each class because this edge has capacity one, so you can only take each class once. Similarly, these edges constrain you to the fact that you can only use each time slot once. Only one flow can pass through YI, so you can't, uh, you can't use it that one more than once. And finally, uh, these edges constrain the actual, apply the actual constraints from the original problem of which classes go in which time slots. You can only take this class in this time slot by going, by sort of pushing the flow through that edge uh, indicates you taking this class at this time slot. And, and so all the constraints are satisfied when you have your max flow. Does that make sense? Yeah, this is definitely um, the most important max flow problem to like understand because so many other max flow problems will reduce to this in some way or another. Like a lot of the ones we're gonna go over in the future um, in this lecture are gonna reduce to this. So make sure you understand how this works. If you have any questions, please speak up. Is there a way to revoke privileges? I don't think so. Yeah, I think we can move on at this point. Yeah. Oh, yeah, what's the complexity of this? So earlier I mentioned that Dynix had a complexity of v squared e. However, this is a very specific type of graph, very, very restricted type of graph. So first off, all the edges have capacity 1. So that in itself reduces Dynix to this much more palatable uh, min of two third of e to the 2 thirds uh, and root e times e. Um, but we can actually do better by realizing this is a unit network, which means a graph where all the nodes have an out edge, have only one out edge of capacity one or one in edge of capacity one. And uh, except S and T obviously. Um, and this on Dynix has a complexity of only E root V. So even when let's say like 10 to the fifth nodes and edges, this would be fine. And as I mentioned, this is why we like Dynix a lot because has very nice complexity on specific types of graphs. OK, next problem, programming tutors. So you have n students and n tutors, um, and they're each located somewhere on, the, on some xy plane. And we want to match each student to a distinct tutor. So each student can only, only can visit one tutor, and each tu tutor can only teach one student. Um, and what you want to do is minimize the max distance that some student has to walk. So look at all the pairs, look at their look at the distances, so how much you need to walk between them, and then minimize the max of that. Okay. N is like less than equal to 100. And this is an example. So if you have the green guys are students and the blue guys are tutors, the best we can do is five by doing this pairing. So both have to walk a distance of five, I think. Right? Because three and four and four. Oh no, no, no. This is only four and this is this is five.
negative 1 times distance and Uh, so I'm not, first of all, I'm not sure negative really works, but you can make it like a big number minus that. So that part isn't really that much of an issue, but I'm not sure how that gives you the answer though. Maybe I'm missing something. One issue with that is you can have sort of flow going from one student to multiple tutors um, in that setup. If you're like allowing more than one flow to go into a student, um, it can kind of split up um, and that kind of uh, defeats the whole purpose of like you want every student to go to a different tutor how does that minimize the distance in any way that just i mean, i understand Oh, you're saying add that, but as Joe said, that can again like split up, you know, like how does the capacity between the two, between a student and a tutor, um, relate to like which one he'll pick, you know, like we want to pick the, the the pairs which are sort of close to each other. How does the capacity between them being small or big relate to that? So one thing is, um, I guess don't think as much about modifying like the actual flow network from the last problem um, as much as, I don't know how to give a good hit for this, but like how you can use the same network that we had in the last problem, um, but in a slightly different way. Over distance. <laughs> I don't... Yeah, making the capacities not one uh, kind of messes with the graph a bit. Um, I'm not sure what that would really do. So yeah, well, one hint is we want to use. Uh, basically the same flow network as last problem yeah. but kind of do something outside of that um yeah it, it's definitely a hard problem um it's another good hint I guess another hint is you're going to run max flow a few times. Um, you're not just going to run it once like we did in the last one. Maybe we just show this one because this is okay, yeah. definitely hard. Um, yeah. So the main idea is that you want a binary search on the answer. So if we fix a given distance, if we fix a given answer, we know which pairs are possible and which pairs are not possible. 
just by are they close enough or far, far too far apart. And for each of the possible pairs, we just make we just put a potential connection for the bipartite matching. Um, and then we just run our usual bipartite matching algorithm through flow. And we check if the maximum flow is n. If the maximum flow is n, everyone got everyone's happy, everyone got their pair. Um, and so that one works, and we can go uh, bigger, uh, sorry, smaller distance. Otherwise, you have to go for a bigger distance. Um, and so complexity is it's the number of nodes is n, uh, number of edges is n squared, uh, number of nodes is n, and we have a test. So that's n squared times root n, because e root v, and then times the log of the maximum distance we have. So it's that. Anyone have any questions about why this works? Or like what specifically we're doing? Yeah. yeah, so the reason this works um, is that if you are given, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So if you're trying to minimize total distance, um, I don't know how you do that. Um, but when you're trying to minimize the maximum distance, um you like if you're given some answer you can definitely tell if that answer is possible um using max flow because you know all the edges that could exist uh, but if you're trying to minimize total distance that's much harder yeah yeah Tom, thomas yeah we're trying to run the flow log in time yeah okay we're, we're using uh, Denix for basically everything here for inverse. Well. Yeah, because as I said before, like restricted Denix here has e root v, which is I think the best you can do at least compared to the other Hopcroft carve or whatever. Same as Hopcroft carve. Um, yeah. Okay. Next problem. Uh, it's called maximum islands. Um, and so you have a two D grid of land, water, and cloud. Um, so you want to think of like you're taking an aerial shot of the of the earth or whatever, and you're, the clouds are the places you're blocked off of. So you can see this, oh, this is for sure land here, it's for sure water here, and you just see clouds here. You don't know what's actually underneath it. So clouds can represent either land or water because you don't know what's there. Um, and so for any representation you can do, so you by fitting the clouds to be either land or water, what's the maximum number of islands you can make? Um, so an island is a connected group of land cells. So connected meaning from like up, down, right, left, not diagonal. Yeah, and yeah, and rows and columns are less than equal to forty. So yeah. Uh, so this is a pretty hard problem and involves techniques we haven't seen before, I think. But uh, some, but uh, some of the uh, halfway is you can just like start at observations and, and get most of the way there, I think. So if you guys have any anything small, you guys see. Uh, Please just yeah, say it, and we can work on solution. Like uh, not even max flow related observations. Yeah, just like anything you can do to the grid to make to try to maximize islands. Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Thomas has the first big observation. So clouds adjacent to land should just be water, because making them land can only make the answer worse. Um, because adding a, a land square here next to another land square cannot increase the number of islands, but it can for sure decrease it by connecting two islands. So you may as well just make the water. Um, with the room, and then once you do that, you just have a bunch of clouds surrounded by water. And so with those remaining clouds, you want to make as many islands as possible. Right? As, as many islands of size one as possible. Because again, you, there's no point in making an island bigger than size one. So this is one um, that we should probably just go over. They are out, I think. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so we want to find the maximum number of clouds so that there is no edge between them, right? Because if there's an edge, uh, then you're not getting two islands from there. You're only getting sort of one island from there. So you want to find the maximum number of clouds that this is no edge. So each one of those guys will be an island themselves. For example, here, 
we start with this guy, we make all the guys next to land water, then we're left with just these clouds surrounded by water. Um, these sort of look like this graph, right? Because this C is this C, the of these C's and these C's, and this these adjacent C's, these edges are like which is connected to which. Um, and then if you make these red guys land, then you get four extra islands, and you can't do better than that. You can't. There's no. You can't make five guys red so that they're not touching. Does everyone see that? So then your final answer would be uh, the number of cloud islands you get here plus however many land islands you had in the beginning, pretty much. Here would be seven. There's four from here and one, two, three. OK. So this requires another technique called maximal independence set. So the MIS of a graph is the greatest number of vertices because no two have an edge between them. Uh, that's exactly what we just talked about, right, with the clouds. So it's just, uh, yeah, so it's the number of vertices that you don't have any edges between them. So here, example, uh, this is a graph. These, this is an example of an MIS. You can't have five that are not touching, but these four are not touching at all. Here, again, the MIS is two. So these guys are not touching. If you made all three of them, they will for sure be touching. Um, and one key thing to realize is that this cloud graph, unlike these graphs necessarily, is bipartite. So uh, this is just a generic thing for like these sort of tile graphs, like the, the, like a grid graph. The graph is induced by having a grid. It always be bipartite. Why? Because you can think of the even and odd checkerboard. So black squares on your checkerboard, sort of not that these are colored in any way, but you want to think of them like if they were colored like a checkerboard, the black ones would only be connected to the white ones, and the white ones would only be connected to the black ones. So that, that's why it's bipartite. So for people who haven't seen bipartite before, basically it just means you can split the vertices into two groups such that um, every edge uh, basically goes between the groups. You don't have any edges like within groups, which, so, which is why the checkerboard works. Because if you split it into black squares and white squares, you never have a black square next to a black square or a white square next to a white square. Right. So yeah, so, so we sort of have this problem of finding this MIS on a bipartite graph. Um, some further background is the concept of a vertex cover. Um, a vertex cover graph is a set of vertices that touches every edge. For example, here, this single no node is a vertex cover because it touches these both of these edges. Similarly, these two guys is a vertex cover of this graph because it touches this edge, this edge, this edge, this edge from here, and then this edge from here. So it touches all the edges. Um, and so we see that a complement of a vertex cover must be an independent set and vice versa. Uh, why? Because um, if you have a set of vertices that touch every edge, and then you look at sort of the nodes on the other side of those edges, they must not be touching each other. So they must be your, your MIS. And then vice versa, if you have a maximum independent set, right, all the guys that you haven't put into your MIS must be touching all the edges that sort of come out of your MIS. Because if not, you may as well, uh, yeah, you may as well sort of add one more and, and get a bigger thing. So that's sort of contradictory. Um, and then, so generally, even if you don't have a maximum independent set, if you have some independent set, uh, this vertex cover will be even will be still a vertex cover. It'll just be redundantly a vertex cover. Um, that was kind of bad bad explanation, but that's the idea. Uh, Joe, if you have a better way to explain that, actually. Basically, like, so if you have an independent set, um, you know that there's no edges between any of the vertices in there. Um, so all the edges have to have at least one endpoint outside that set. Um, so they have at least one endpoint in the complement, uh, which means that the complement is a vertex cover. Um, and then in the same way, if you have a vertex cover, um, you know that every edge uh, touches at least one vertex in that set. Um, so if you take everything that's not in that set, you can't have an edge that's like fully within there because it has to touch something outside the set. Uh, yeah. So. Finding our MIS then is reduced to just finding a minimal vertex cover, so vertex cover is a small size, and then doing n minus that right, to finally get the complement. Any questions on this so far? Oh, yeah, good point. I mean, I'm pretty fast.
Okay, yeah, I think we can move on. Okay. So um, this leads us to Koenig's theorem. So for a bipartite graph, the size of the maximal matching turns out to be the size of the minimal vertex cover. And remember, the minimal vertex cover is what we're looking to find. Um, and yeah. So that's pretty much it. So as an example here, uh, the, this is our minimal vertex cover, right? We're only a single node. And this is the same size, our maximal matching. So maximal matching here is just uh, this, 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 this node to this node. Um, and here, from this node to this node, this node to this node, that's our maximal matching. We can't do better than two. Um, and this is also happens to be the same size as our minimal vertex cover here, two nodes. Um, so this gives us a way to use this to solve a problem. So since we want the MISE set of clouds, we can instead find the maximal matching and use these following qualities. So we can say that the size of our maximal matching gives us the size of our minimal vertex cover. This is by Koenig's theorem. Then the size of our maximal matching is just the number of clouds, so minus the size of this MIS by just the complement slide that we had before. And the size of this uh, is then just the uh, size of the MIS is just the size of the number of clouds minus the maximal matching. Um, and that's our final answer. So all we have to do is run our bipartite matching algorithm to get it, because it's a bipartite graph, remember? to get our maximal matching and then subtract that from the number of clouds. Oh yeah, any questions? This is a rather common thing that comes up if we ever need to find an MIS of a bipartite graph, doing this set of calculations all comes up pretty often. So basically the like matching flow we're gonna do is you uh, color the clouds like a checkerboard and then um, you put like all of the black square clouds on the left, the white square clouds on the right, um, and you connect any adjacent ones, and then you want the maximal matching through that, essentially. Okay, okay next problem uh, is tile cut. This is a really fun one, I think. Uh, so we have an N by M grid of tiles with the letters W, I, and N. Um, and you can sort of cut out adjacent triplets of slides that spell with, for example, uh, where's example here? Uh, you can go W, I, N here. Um, but you can't reuse the pieces. Um, and you want to maximize the number of W, I, Ns you can cut out. So here the answer is five. You can go like W, I, N, W, I, N, W, I, N, W, I, N, and W, I, N. So yeah, you want to find the maximum number you can cut out. Any ideas? So, so this one we're, come, we're done with the bipartite matching for now. So think about like what flow graphs you can make. The structure of the graph is going to be kind of similar, sort of, uh, to the bipartite matching graph we had, though. Think about how you could like modify that a bit to handle um, the win thing.
Yeah. So you guys have sort of the first step. So okay, if you can go to the next slide, yeah. You're muted, by the way. I'm muted, sorry. So you have edges from the source to all the Ws, then edges from all the ends to the sink, um, and then you have edges from W to all the adjacent I's, and then from all the I's to the adjacent ends. So as Yaki Thomas said, you have sort of the three, or, or sorry, as Ishan said, you have like the, the columns, um, and you have the flows between them if they're adjacent, and all these have capacity ones. So think about does this work, and is there, if there's any issues with this solution. So I, I think for the example we had earlier, it does work. But are, are there any? What about some other? Can you come up with a counterexample? I think just show the counterexample. Show the counterexample. Yeah. I guess we're running out of time. Yeah. Um, so the issue here is that eyes can be reused. So here, right, our sort of flows here only constrain the fact that each W can be used once and each N can be used once. But I is there's no constraint on. So even if these flows are only one, you can have both W flowing into I and both I flowing out. And both from fly to N flowing out. So the way you want to fix this is somehow have a capacity on a node itself, not on the edge. And this is a rather common problem. And the way you solve it is by splitting the node into two, uh, into two nodes. And so one uh, side of the node is only for in edges, and one side of the node is only for out edges. Um, and in the middle, you have an edge from the sort of in vertex to the out vertex with the capacity that you want. And that, that edge can sort of enforce the flow through that node. Um, and so that gives us our solution here, uh, which is just to do that for all the eyes. So instead of, instead of having just a single eye here, you have an eye in and an eye out, and you can only have one flow through it. So each eye can only be used once. Any questions? OK, let's keep going then. Uh, so before we get into the next problem, I want to talk. Oh, I want to talk about the uh, max flow min cut theorem. So a set of edges in a flow network is a cut if removing it sort of splits the network into two. If it disconnects the flow from S to T, if it makes it zero. For example, uh, here, uh, the, this is the blue line is an example of a cut because once you do that, you can't get from S to T. And the weight of a cut is the sum of all the capacities in the cut. So for example, the weight here is 23. And there's a theorem called the min flow max cut theorem, which says that the, si the weight of the min cut is equal to the weight of the max flow. And if you think about it, I mean, it's not like super rigorous, but that kind of makes sense, right? Because um, sort of the amount of total capacity you have to remove to get the flow down to zero uh, in the best case is going to be the amount of flow you have, right? Yeah. Oh, um, because notice that there's still no path from S to T, even with the nine edge still there, because that edge is sort of going backwards. So you, even with the nine edge there, you can't get from S to T. So we don't really care if like the whole graph is connected or not. We just want there to be no path from S to T. With the directions. Okay. Um, so, yeah. so if there was another path from S to T, um, you would have to kind of cut that too. You have to sort of um, cut enough so that there's no path from S to T. Yeah, what, what Joe, Joe's argument earlier sort of only shows that min cut is at least max flow. Um, but there's a nice argument yeah. to show that it's equal, actually. Yeah. OK, so keep this. Uh, oh, there's more, more questions? More not questions. necessarily. I mean, it's not going to use 
every path in like like if you're doing max flow but like if you remove some edges as long as there is like a path the flow will be non-zero okay yeah so keep that idea in mind for this next problem called cops and robbers so you have an n by m grid of characters um, robbers start at the square marked B, so here it's in the middle here, and they ha other squares have either numbers, digits on them, or dots. And each digit from one to nine is how much it takes to block a square. Um, and blocks with uh, squares with dots cannot be blocked. Um, so you want to find the minimal cost to stop the robbers from reaching the edge of the grid. So basically, from stopping them from escaping. So, for example, here you can block these squares, and that will stop the robbers from leaving. And if you add these up, you get 36. So the best you can do here is 36. So take a minute to think about how you can do this with flow, and specifically how you can use um, min cut equals max flow um, to solve this. So the key here is rather than thinking about um, like the flow through any of the nodes, which is what we were thinking about before, here you want to think about um, the cut, like the uh, minimal cut to separate S and T, um, which will give you the same answer and it'll give you the same flow network. Um, but it's a sort of different way of thinking about the problem. Yeah, you sort of literally have a cut here. You, you have the block, the blocking that you want to do to cut the robbers off from the outside world. So you want to think about how to, and you would want to make that cut as sort of cheap as possible. So how are you going to formulate that in terms of a graph? And if you guys have any observations about like, what would the source be? What would the sink be? Anything like that, um, feel free to give any like partial thoughts. So like for finding S and T, uh, since we're looking for a cut, think about like, what are the two things we're trying to separate um, with this cut? And that'll kind of give you an idea of what you want to make S and T. Yeah, so the B will be the source. Um, and then the sync, exactly. Yeah, you want the sync be a node connected to everything on the edge. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, so, wait. Oops. Yeah. Right, so that's exactly it. Um, now think about the rest of the graph. Uh, and. Uh, so, Daniel, one thing is that uh, this column setup we've had before in, in the, the bipartite graph graph, the wind thing, is not necessary. Flow can just be on a graph. It doesn't have to worry about columns. Yeah, so this is going to be definitely, like, the least visualizable graph, um, flow graph we do. Um, 
but kind of think about so the wind problem is going to be useful um think about how you can kind of use what we had in the wind problem with like the two nodes um and do something like that here Because like we're, we're sort of dealing with a similar issue here where like um, we want to control the flow through yeah. a node. So like we're, we want to block nodes, not edges. Right. Yeah. Um, which is the, kind of the same thing we had with the eyes, right? Where we had to sort of add that edge to control the flow through the eye. Also, something I think we haven't mentioned yet is that um, in these flow graphs, you can add edges with capacity basically infinity, where you basically have just set it to some really big number, um, and that simulates having a capacity of infinity. Uh, it's it's kind unnecessary. Of, it's kind of on the right track, but you can do it with two. Two, yeah, you can do it with two nodes. I think we should show this. Yeah, one. I think, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So the trick for each one is, is to split each node into an in node and an out node. That's what we sort of had before. Where all the, the edges going into the node go into the in node, and all the edges coming out of the node go out from the out node. And the control edge just goes from the in to the out. You have this control edge. Um, and so what we can do is give the dot nodes infinite weight. So I'm, I'm going to now be talking about giving weight to the nodes themselves. And the way we do that is you give weight to the sort of control edge in the middle. So the dot nodes get infinite weight. Uh, B is a source. The border has infinite wedge edges to all the sync. And then you can just run the max flow algorithm, and this gives you the size of the min cut. And so you never, and so the, your algorithm will never prefer cutting an infinite edge. So it'll just cut the middle finite control edges, which will try to block B out from the edges, from the outside. So here's an example. Uh, so if you have two adjacent squares, one of size four and one of one with value five, you'll have an edge from five out to four in and from four out to five in of infinite weight. And then you'll have the control edge in the middle of the actual value. So with the min cut algorithm, we'll prefer cutting these guys out. Yeah. And so you sort of make this pair for every square you have, um, where if you have like a dot you give it infinite capacity instead of whatever the number is. Um, and then you connect all the adjacent ones with infinite weight edges from the out to the in in both directions. Um, so it's hard to visualize um, when you have more than like two of these groups at a time. But you sort of have this setup where between every adjacent pair, you have the infinite edges going from the out to the in both ways. Mm -hmm. Anyone have questions on this? Okay, let's keep going. Uh, next one is called bricks. This one's pretty hard. Uh, yeah, so you're given a- Just for context, this is a div one E. 
this is like the hardest problem in uh, Code Forces Div One round. So this isn't something that, um, like, any of us would realistically be able to solve in a contest. But it's like a really cool trick. Um, yeah. Yeah. So you're given a grid of n by m characters where these hashtags represent filled, and dots represent unfilled characters. And you have an infinite number of one by k bricks for all k. What's the least number of bricks you need to fill all the open spots? Remember, for this one, you need you need four bricks. So this guy can go here, this guy can go here, and this guy can go here, and this can fill the little spot in the middle. Um, and there are other solutions with four pieces here. Um, so I, I think for this one, I think I should just go to the slides, uh, right? Yeah, definitely. Because this is, I don't know how anyone came up with this solution. Okay, so setting up the graph. So you want to make vertices between every pair of open squares. So instead of making the dots themselves the nodes, you want to make the sort of gap between them a node. Um, and then so when you're thinking of dividing the grip, grid into bricks, it's like a subset of these vertices. So if you have um, a vertex that you take from our graph, and that sort of means like joining the two guys next to each other, next to each other next to each other together. So as in taking them as part of the same brick. And if you don't take that vertex, it's like these two are in separate bricks. So how, how are we going to use this graph to minimize the number of bricks that we take? Oh, so first, here's an example. So if this is our subset of, uh, of guys that we take, then that gives us, uh, oops, that gives us this uh, so, so set up of bricks. You know? So, so you can see that, like, um, if a grid is like in the bottom set, um, that means the two squares on either side of it are in the same brick, right? So like the, the one yeah, the we have bottom it. vertex is not in the final set because that's between two different bricks there, between the blue and the green. That means we, we don't take this, this one that is going to be the same guy. So an, another thing is that taking a vertex sort of decreases the number of bricks by one. So every time we don't take a vertex, that sort of splits the two bricks apart and increases the number of bricks we take. So we want to maximize the number of vertices we take. So if we took all the vertices, then it'll be one giant brick. Of course, that isn't always possible, but that's sort of the goal here. And so the, our answer is going to be the number of, of, of open squares, right, minus the number of vertices that we take. So the at worst case, if we took no vertices, they would all be in separate bricks. Each would be like, like the blue brick here. But by taking some vertices, we reduce each time we do that, we reduce the number of, of bricks we want. So, but the question is, what restriction do we have on taking vertices? Why can't we just take all the, all, all the vertices? Why, why do we have to somehow split it up into bricks? Um, and the trick here is that you want to think of like L shapes. So we can't have three squares in the L pattern in the same brick. This, this can't happen. Uh, because otherwise, because then we're not in a one by k brick anymore. We're in some sort of weird domino brick, some, some sort of Tetris brick. Um, and so what we do is we connect all our pairs of vertices that make an L shape. So what makes an L shape? If we're sort of like in a diagonal here, right? Um, so all these vertices that sort of join together in L shape, we take, the, we take each pair of vertices and connect the mine edge in our graph. And then when we compute the MIS of this, the maximal independence, maximal independence set of this, uh, that gives us our answer. So this is how an example of that graph. So these guys are represent L shape. So we put an edge between them because L shape, L shape. And for example, I don't know, these guys represent L shape. So we put an edge between these two vertices. And if we take an MIS of this, that means we've taken only vertices that are not connected by an edge. So then we don't. So then those guys don't create an L shape. So we never create an L shape, and our bricks are all okay. And and these guys are going to be a bipartite graph because of the same checkerboard argument from earlier. Yeah, you have like a sort of rotated checkerboard for. Yeah. I mean, you can kind of see here with the that with the diamond here. It's like the same thing. Yeah, you're always connecting like uh, sort of a horizontal vertex to a vertical vertex, like one that's in between two horizontal things to one that's in between two vertical things. Uh, and so, if find the MIS and subtract that by the number of open squares. That's your answer. Uh, any questions on this? I know it went kind of fast, so if you have any questions.
so you guys see how this kind of just reduces to the MIS because you like, again, taking more vertices means you need less bricks. And as long as they're an independent set, you don't have any L's. And if you don't have any L's, then all your bricks are good. So it works out. Notice that when we say we don't have any L's, that doesn't mean that we're not we're just avoiding just L pieces. Even if you have like a two by K, two by K uh, size break, it'll inside it contain some L's. And we avoid that. Uh, so if you avoid any L's, then it just has to be like of height one or of width one. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Uh, we have a bunch of problems in the next two slides and resources. And yeah, these slides are on Discord. So this is a template that uh, I use on, on for Linux. There's some here's some CP algorithms articles on on Ford Fulkerson's and Linux and other Maxwell stuff. And this is a Wikipedia link for the Maxwell min cut theorem. It, there's a really cool proof. You want to check it out. Um, and there's a bunch of Core Forces blogs you can find on like uh, H, uh, HLPAP and all the different types of like Maxwell algorithms. You can, if you want, if you're interested in that. And here's the problems that we did in the lecture and some other nice problems for you to try. Uh, I think these ones are a lot easier than the uh, last one.